The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Three weeks and one day until the start of the NBA season, the real one. Training camp this week. Preseason games this week. It's Rosh Hashanah. What more could you ask for? <laughs> What's happening, everybody? Welcome to another week of Fantasy NBA. Today, I am Dan Baspris, your host. This show, as always, brought to you by Hoop Ball. Hoop-ball.com. I like to call them our benevolent overlords. It's a Hoop Ball presentation. We're a Hoop Ball podcast. Go there. Hoop-ball.com or follow at HoopBallFantasy on Twitter. You can follow me on social media as well, at Dan Baspris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. Best bris, I know. It's a weird one. But if you can spell it, you can find me, and I'd love it if you did. Uh, more pros this week. Five of them, to be exact. We got five shows this week. We got five pros. We have seven left to air, so that'll take us through Tuesday of next week. So we don't really have to plan anything for about eight shows. That's the easy living, man. Uh, and in terms of what we're up to today, I see no reason to mess around for even 60 more seconds but i will mess around for 40 because i want to give a fat thank you to our buddies at hawaiian isles kona coffee company the presenting sponsor of all audiovisual elements here at hoop ball hawaiian isles kona coffee hawaiian isles.com is the website check them out immediately hi kona coffee on twitter or you can just search for hawaiian isles on amazon their products are largely prime But, you know, you don't even have to have a Prime account. You can get 35 bucks and get the shipping deal anyway. If you have a Prime account, you can get less than 35 bucks, and it'll still get sent to you in two days. Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. Thank you, as always, to their continued partnership. And, uh, like I said, I didn't see any reason to do 60 seconds, so why wait? No man is more fun. No man has spent more time in the drive through line at Carl's Jr. over the last half year. And so... um, Man, I'm just I'm just happy that you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I was gonna die going through the Carl's Jr. line. Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, you gotta be. Listen, I remember the days when I used to go there enough to make myself ill. I didn't do it. I didn't do it sober. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm I'm not getting a full meal every day, but I am good. Well, anytime the D backs lose, which thank God the season is done on Sunday. And I probably won't go to Carl Jr. for another couple years. So yeah, uh, after this experiment, but it's it's almost over with. There's light at the end of the tunnel, as there might be with my life soon. So, that's that, we'll see. <laughs> that's marvelous. I don't know if I, I feel like most of the people listening to this show know what I'm talking about. By the way, we're talking to the the Bog Man. Remember when I used to get you, call you that by accident? That those were <laughs> simpler. Times. Bog Man. Yeah, that's Bog right. Man. Uh, at Bogman Sports. Follow him. Do it quick. Um, you guys cover a million different sports, and this one was baseball-related. Every time the Arizona Diamondbacks lost this year, you went to Carl's Jr., which, I mean, even the best teams in baseball lose 60-something times. That's a, that's a <laughs> recipe for trouble. Yeah, I think we're uh, coming up on, I believe this was their 76th loss. So, mm. um uh, I'll, uh, it, it's bad. So the, all the, all the employees know me, so it's, it's not fun. So, oh man. Uh, I, I gotta tell you, I know we, we all joke about everything. That's a pretty damn funny bit you did. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, funny. I'm, I'm just glad it's almost over. I did get the people like concerned for my health. Like I'm not the super size me guy, right? I'm not going there for three meals a day when the D-backs <laughs> lose. I go through the drive through uh, I get something off the menu, and then I make a video. So uh, sometimes it was a soda, you know. Sometimes it was a chicken sandwich. It wasn't like I'm getting the double uh, baconator, Ooh. you know, uh, with barbecue sauce and cheese every single time. I did get that on occasion. I'm not skinny, <laughs> so I'm actually way more concerned for your gastric system than your health. As someone who... Ah, uh, well, that's been screwed up for a long time. Yeah. So I've... It's just not going to get any better, so I've got those fine. problems, too. Um, can I... I want to go with a non sequitur before we talk about your team uh, from the, the industry mock. I 
am an Angelino, which you and I have joked about many times. Um, and so I grew up on Dodger Dogs. That was one of my things. And I worked for the Visalia Oaks before they were the Rawhide. And um, the the owner of the team is, or was, I think he's now sold it or he's selling it, uh, Walter O'Malley's grandson. So there was a pretty strong Dodger connection there. And he he sort of figured out a way to get a hookup with the the Farmer John's providers and so we carried Dodger Dogs in Visalia for whatever reason. We were D-backs affiliate at the time, so there was no tie in there. And I thought, yes, my dream finally realized. And I was, jeez, what was I? I was like 23 years old at this time. So I, the world was my oyster. Um, I ate two Dodger Dogs at all 70 of our home games. And <laughs> I, I can... That's uh, worse than what I did. Yeah, it's bad. It was real bad. I mean, I was like... But I, I, and I just kept doing it because they were so delicious, but the pain was so real. Uh, I still get one when I go to actual Dodger games, but luckily that's like once a year now. So I've, I've been down that road. I, I would recommend it. It's why I thought what you did was so damn funny because I was like, I've done something stupid like that. Uh, anyway, how are you otherwise? You got baseball, the end of the line here. You're ready to, to just watch the playoffs and enjoy them? Yes, yes. So we just finished recording before... Uh, we are doing this, the final baseball show of the season. We are going to have more off-season baseball stuff uh, this year than we have because we're not going to do the book again. Um, so I, I'm I'm actually happy about that. I, I think it's better in podcast form from us. So uh, we're we're going to have that. You know, football is in. We're in the middle of football season. You can find us everywhere doing that. ITL, uh, fan tracks, FNTSY, all that stuff. I got college football going on right before you called me. Uh, just imagine uh, if this could happen in basketball, uh, Dan, where just the best player, the number one pick in college fantasy football, uh, just decided he's going to redshirt for the rest of this year and Ooh. then transfer. So uh, that just happened like two minutes before uh, you called in. That's why you were like, I'm ready. I'm like, I need five minutes. So <laughs> I, I need to see yeah, if this I... is for real, what's happening here. I need to process this for a second. Wow. So we got all the sports going on. The only thing we don't do is hockey. And, uh, you know, it runs the same time as basketball. So just don't have time for it. There's a very old joke that that reminded me of where it's a gambler sitting in a casino and he's he's lost like 17 bets in a row and his buddy's coming over to console him and he's like, oh, what happened, man? The first guy says, I... Oh, man, I went 0-6 on NFL today. He goes, oh, man, that's rough. And he goes, yeah, and I, I went 0-7 on my baseball bets today. He goes, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty brutal. He goes, yeah, and then yesterday I was 0-4 on my college football bets. I, I just I don't know what to do. And the first guy says, well, I got I to gotta lead on a good hockey game. And the guy says, well, what the bleep do I know about hockey? da 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 uh, again, at Bogman Sports, give him a follow on Twitter. Uh, in terms of the the in this league stuff, I usually say in this league dot com, but uh, it, the, there's a Twitter handle. You guys have you do stuff with uh, different radio stations. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the the wimpy podcast host thing here and just give you the floor. Tell people the things that you want them to listen to. Yeah, I mean, in, in this league dot com, uh, or just look up on your podcast provider. Uh, in this league, fantasy, baseball, football, basketball. Uh, the Welsh has Prospect One. I do college fantasy football. We're on FNTSY for three hours on Saturdays. That's also available in podcast form. And we're on Fan Tracks, where the Welsh and I do the Black Book with Joe Pizapia talking about football. And I do the individual defensive podcast with Gary Davenport on there. Good and Lord. then uh, college fantasy football on campus with John Lobb. So that is all the shows that I'm involved in <laughs> as it stands right now. You uh, you don't want to add any more to that mix. I guess we do have Big 3 coming up here pretty soon, don't we? Big 3 is going to yeah. be coming up when the season starts. You, me, and Jonas. Ah, uh, we're going to be doing that, um, and that's going to be great. A lot of people love that show. It's I've, I've heard many times it's their favorite one. <laughs> uh, the, the Welsh doesn't like that very much, but, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> I think it's hilarious. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love that show for a couple of reasons. One, it's just damn fun to do. And two, as I've said on, on your show before, I love being sort of a guest on a show because then I can really get weird and there's nothing holding me back. Cause what are you going to do? Hold me back? No, I'm going to hold me. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, I have a few things that I want to talk about. I obviously want to get through your team from this nine cap, but I was, as I was thinking about your team, earlier today and i sort of ended up getting in lost in my own thoughts on on part of 
uh, and I'll pull back the curtain here. Uh, Bogman and I are recording this on the 23rd. That's not when it's airing. But on the show that I did on the 23rd, I was talking about the first two rounds of our industry mock, and I got to you on the turn, and I thought to myself, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is early, obviously, for a guy that we're going to talk about here a lot, but it also brings up a broader picture item, which is how do, we, how do you deal with being the 12th pick, being on the turn at the end of the first round, beginning of the second for me, Bogman, I know my move is I spend like a week just trying to come to terms with the fact that there are like 30 guys I'm not going to get that I might have right. wanted. And in this mock, you went the other way. You said, screw that. I'm going to take my guy, even if it means taking him a little bit early. You had LeBron and Mitchell Robinson on the turn. I think everybody knows I'm talking about Mitch. Um, so how did you end up kind of leaning in that direction from those two ways the needle could move? All right. So, I mean, this happened for a couple different reasons. And I know people, I mean, some guy called it a troll pick. <laughs> on, uh, you know, when we were releasing the picks and stuff. It wasn't a troll pick. It was too early. And I'm fully aware of that and willing to admit that it was too early to take Mitchell Robinson. I want Mitchell Robinson as my second round pick. We're not playing this out. This is a mock. And this is to get people aware of names and things like that. It's still early in the season for a lot of people. I mean, you know, basketball people aren't as casual as football people. P- football people will pick up a magazine on their way to a draft and and try to read it. Basketball people a little bit more involved, but this is still early. It's not even October yet. So, um, you know, I, I took Mitchell Robinson. I want him in the second round. Now, I hope that I'm picking one and he falls <laughs> to me uh, with the 24th pick in a 12, man. I would much prefer that. But I took LeBron and I'm looking at my team and you're right. You, you know, you have to kind of come to grips with the fact that you're just not going to get some people. When you're on the turn. But what I didn't want to do, and you made this point, uh, I, you know, maybe a week or two ago on uh, Fantasy NBA Today, where you said that all I want is someone that isn't going to kill my team, you know, and someone that isn't going to sink me. Well, I have LeBron. I don't think he's going to sink me. No. I know a lot of people think he's going to take a step back, and he was hurt last year. So what I don't want to do is add a giant health risk with that. What I wanted to do here was take Joel Embiid. But then I'm taking LeBron and Embiid, both guys that could miss time uh, because, you know, either they're getting sat at the end of the year, load management, that kind of stuff. I don't think Mitchell Robinson's that kind of guy. Plus, I really want him. So I just said, ah, screw it. I'll just take Mitchell Robinson. We'll see how this uh, pans out. And, you know, the reaction was worse than that of my Carl's Jr. videos. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I'm not going to take him at 13, but I stand by getting your guys. If you're in a position and you really like someone and this is the only spot where you can get him and you don't feel like you can play the season without that guy, take him. You know, uh, I'm I'm not going to go as far to say YOLO, but I am uh, going to go as far as to say, you know, this is your team. This is your season. If there's a guy that you think is going to be worth it here then go ahead and take him. And that's why I took Mitchell Robinson, because I think the upside is through the absolute roof. Yeah, so I mean, I we, love him. without question, the upside is crazy. And we've talked about it before. Basically, with every minute he gets, his rank goes up by eight slots. So uh, if you sort of extrapolate from his 20 minutes last year at number 47, he needs about another seven or eight minutes to get up into that department. I, I probably don't think he's getting to 27, 28 minutes a game this year. Um, but like you said, I mean, this is a mock number one. You don't have to, there's, there's, there's no money on this for you. This is a guy you were targeting. If you had, let's say, uh, Bogman, you had like 500 bucks on this league. Let's call it a pretty damn big money league. Would you still have made this move or would you have gone a little bit more safe and just said, you know what, this, I, I, I got screwed. I got the 12th pick. I didn't do an auction draft. Uh, I'm going to take I don't know who the hell else is going around this Kawhi or something like no that. No chance in hell. I would have taken this if I had 500 bucks on this league. <laughs> I might have still taken LeBron with one of those two picks. Yeah. But I wouldn't have risked Mitchell Robinson. You know, I would have, uh, I, I, to be honest, I probably go super safe and go like LeBron and Kemba, something yeah. like that. Cause I like the centers, uh, later in the draft as well. Um, but, uh, I, I would have gone much safer than taking Mitchell Robinson with LeBron James. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think there's sort of two uh, schools of thought related to that. And then I, I do want to move along to uh, your third pick. Uh, heaven forbid we heaven forbid we get past <laughs> number 13. Um, 
you know, the competition obviously dictates some of what you can do in a spot like this too, where if you're playing against uh, a, a sort of an intermediate league, you can go really safe and you can usually win. You're so nice, Dan. We just call them rubes and boobs. If you're playing against rubes and boobs, they might they may not know about Mitchell Robinson. You could get him in the third, fourth round. Yeah, so. precisely. You go safe here. You build your, your firm foundation. You don't need to take any chances. But if this was a real league playing out, uh, of 12 fantasy analysts, you do kind of have to take a shot or two in there. Um, and so you, you can kind of, you can kind of put a, that into that bucket a little bit and say, you know what? I listen, I'm not going to win this league unless I do something a little bit crazy. Sure. Maybe I can go safe and place fourth, which is kind of like, all right, you know what? I stay out of the spotlight on both the front or the back end of this league and that's fine. Um, uh, but that's probably not going to beat the, the heavy hitters. And, You're, one more thing on yeah. Mitchell Robinson that a bunch of people aren't taking into consideration is last year we were taking Donovan Mitchell in the second round because you think of that rookie year to second year jump. You know, the guy's gone through a full season in the NBA. He knows about the brutality of the schedule. They know how to keep their you know body in shape and able to play for 82 games in a season. Well, we also have Trey Young and we've got Luka Doncic going in the second round in a lot of drafts as well for that same deal. You know, it's the same reason why uh, a guy like Donovan Mitchell was going uh, up that high. I don't want Mitchell Robinson. Well, I mean, I want him to. I don't need him to do so much more than what he was doing at the end of the season last year. If he just stays a little bit in that range where he's getting two and a half blocks and a steal a game and, you know, he averaged six and a half boards. You know, if he gets somewhere around 10 points, this isn't a guy that's going to kill me. He doesn't shoot free throws very well. Maybe he takes more of those and it sinks me there. But I'm okay with that. You know, I don't think he's going to get up to the seven, eight free throws in a game that really, really sinks you. So uh, I'm okay with his, you know, because we haven't talked about his production at all. It's just why the hell are you taking him here? It's because, like you said, a couple minutes more and he's averaging now three blocks and maybe a little bit over a steal a game. Plus, maybe the boards come up. You know, if he takes that little bit of uh, of development, plus the minutes, uh, he's going to be an absolute superstar. Be be a first-round pick next year. You mentioned free throws. You sort of leaned into that a little bit with your third-round pick anyway, (laughs) right? Uh, I did, yeah. And that's Uh, Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons. Yeah. You know, Uh, I think he's the perfect guy to pair with uh, LeBron and Mitchell Robinson to start when he falls down here. I know you hate Ben Simmons, right? Like you, I do, you but I never punt anything. Him. I never punt anything. So, right. I mean, at this point, you've sort of said, the hell with free throws. And so then Ben Simmons makes a ton of sense. Because if you turn free throws off, he leapfrogs from whatever he was, 60-something, uh, 57, to like top 20. So that's, that's a pretty big leap from one category getting turned off. Right, exactly. So I just saw the value. He does too much stuff. Uh, kind of leaning into the free throw stuff because I have LeBron as well. So, um, yeah, I, I thought Ben Simmons was a pretty good pairing. I like the build on this team. I, I'm not, you know, obviously, like I said, I'm not going to take Mitchell Robinson at 13 in a real draft, but I like the build of how this team turned out because my next pick was Jaron Jackson Jr. And if you thought the first pick, if you thought 13 was a troll pick, this was way more of a troll pick <laughs> because I know I'm taking uh, two spots ahead of Jonas. Yeah, you you did that entirely to Jonas, didn't you? Well, I also like Jaron Jackson, so uh, I thought the pick fit. Uh, I want another big man. I'm going to go late on my point guards at this point. I mean, I get Ben Simmons as a point guard. Uh, I know I'm going to have to get another late one, but um, I, I wanted I wanted this front court pairing uh, Jackson with Mitchell Robinson. I think is is nice. So your, I got a ton of upside in the front there. Your team is not going to have any problem in the defensive category department at this point. Uh, you have loaded up on steals and blocks in the first four rounds. You know I love defensive stats. Um, it, Jaron Jackson, this is thirty seven now. I think he's actually come down a tiny bit in the latest Yahoo uh, adjustments, which is kind of cool although we'll see if that actually bears itself out in any in any real draft scenarios um fifth round pick you took a rookie because be, i assume you did that just so that we wouldn't have to talk about him because you know how i feel about <laughs> <laughs> no, i actually i, I mean, really don't know also... i don't yeah i don't know anything about john morant so you guys can you guys can just sell me either way on this dude oh uh, you don't know anything about john morant not a single thing almost nothing i know that i've been told he has triple double potential yeah, I mean, look, I, I bought him here for the assist. You know, uh, you kind of talked about it. I um, I didn't 
Uh, I, I don't have I, I have one point guard in Ben Simmons. He does a lot of stuff. He's going to sink me in free throws and stuff. And I got them from LeBron a little bit. But now my two big men are really, like you said, they're defensive stats. You know, they're uh, boards, they're steals, and uh, th- they're blocks. So, but John Morant last year, and I've already heard people talking about how he's going to average uh, double-digit assist, and that's what he did at Murray State: ten assists a game. So uh, he shot pretty well, fifty percent from the field, eighty-one uh, percent from the line, and he averaged twenty-four points with um, what was it, one point seven. Uh, three pointers a game so he can shoot the three he can assist he can score he can do some of the stuff that I'm missing up to this point plus playing in Memphis and Memphis has said they want to get away from grit and grind they want to move the pace a little bit faster Uh, I think that he is uh, a good add here especially because point guard is a weak position this season so yeah uh, I think that uh, to be honest I kind of feel like he's a deal here I know you're never going to take him because he's a rookie but I, I like him in the in the fifth. This is true. I will. I will not. Um, the the your next pick actually surprised me a little bit because it kind of it, it sort of runs in uh, in contrast to some of your earlier ones, and that's C.J. McCollum, who you could probably argue is the safest sixth round pick on the board every <laughs> year forever. Uh, I, I get safe at some point, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I can't argue with it. You know how I love safe picks. Um, at this point, were you looking to shore up three pointers a little bit? Just get a shooting yeah. guard into your lineup. Yeah, points and 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 threes uh, are the things that I'm missing uh, with my first couple picks here. So getting Caesar McCollum gets me both of those. You know, he'll throw in some dimes as well. Uh, good shooting percentage, also. So I, I'm. I'm with CJ McCollum here, and you're absolutely right. I'm trying to get threes. So yeah, that makes sense. And then your next pick coming back in the seventh, uh, at the end of the seventh, this is an absolute no-brainer given your team's build at this point. Montrezl Harrell, uh, if you're if you've decided free throws are not an issue, massive defensive stats, points, rebounds, uh, steals, blocks, huge field goal percent. He sort of complements the stuff that you had earlier in the draft you're gonna blow everybody out of the water in a few categories in this league yeah and i and that's kind of the point here is adding stacking those good categories to make sure because i know i'm gonna be real low in field goals so or in free throw percentage so if i'm gonna be real low there i gotta be real high in at least three other categories and being that this is roto so uh you know i'm gonna get blocks i'm gonna get steals and hopefully uh, this is putting me over the top of most people with rebounds. So that's why I added Montrez Harrell. And then his teammate, Lou Williams. So Yeah, I'm a little lower Lou... on Lou than you, I think. I- I'm a little worried about his space with Kawhi and uh, and Paul George in town. But we're going to be missing uh, Paul George for a True. big chunk of the season. And Kawhi is going to get load management. So I think w- we're talking about, uh, you know, maybe 45 to 35 games where you have to worry about. Other than that, he's normal Lou Williams. So uh, obviously he's taking a step back, but I think getting him here is kind of getting him at a value. So like I said, I, I think that he's going to he's gonna have some games with those guys that are still okay. He's going to have some stinkers in there too, I'm sure. But there's also going to be uh, the part of the season where Paul George is missing and load management on the back end. So I, I think Lou Williams is um, not maybe not a great pick, but I think it's fine. Uh, right here you went on a little bit of a shooting guard spree here uh lou williams and then your next pairing was kevin herter and jeremy lamb i really like both of these picks by the way i'm i'm all four thumbs up from uh from old dan bespris uh herter lots of upside and then jeremy lamb we don't know how long victor oladipo is going to be out he's got he's got plenty of wiggle room in indy and you know he still might have some even when victor comes back but even if he doesn't if you get two to three months of, of what he did in Charlotte last year, that's a big win at this point in a draft. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and this is kind of, you know, one of those things where maybe if I'm looking good in some of these categories and uh, Lou Williams is no good, I can dump him. Jeremy Lamb is one of my last picks. So he's a guy where if Oladipo comes back and it's just sucking the life out of him, I can dump him as well for a hot free agent. So I think these guys specifically can help me in the beginning of the season. And then if I have to trade them or dump them, something of that nature, it's not going to hurt me too much. No, so. no, no, not at all. And you got it. There's a games cap in the format that we set up here as well. And I set it at 82. So it actually sort of minimizes the need for bench players. So if you can squeeze 
high level production out of guys, even for a slightly shorter, like you don't need 80 games out of Jeremy Lamb for him to be useful. If you get 30 out of him where he's crushing, that buys you two months to pick somebody up off the wire to kind of fill into that spot. If that's what it happens to be. I, I, I love that way of using one of your last spots in Roto is just making sure you constantly have someone who's performing at a top 50 clip, even if it's not a top 50 full season value, the games, the individual games in Roto are what matters because things don't reset every week. So, uh, you know, every bucket you get is is valuable. Uh, and then with your 11th round pick, you went with uh, safe plotting P.J. Tucker, who falls, I mean, what are you doing to me here, man? You got Jeremy Lamb, you got P.J. <laughs> Tucker. This is like... My, I gotta get my rocket, you know. I'm, I'm a Rockets fan. I, I gotta get one. At I least, love it. So. I love it, man. You know this is my wheelhouse. He's an old fart. <laughs> I love PJ Tucker, man. He's one of my my favorite players. Not only is he a Rocket, he's also a Texas grad. I'm a huge Longhorns fan, so I I, I love getting him, especially late. And uh, they're gonna he's gonna have a role, uh, especially when they play against teams that want to go small. Capella's gonna come off the court, and Tucker's gonna come in just like they did in the playoffs last year with uh, against the Warriors. It didn't work, but uh, hopefully with a little more uh, strategery here, it can work <laughs> this season. And then you know I had to take my cousin. Bogdan Bogdanovich, <laughs> so at the very end of the trap. So. That's right. I was actually going to give you the opening to clown on my 11th round pick, which was easily my dumbest of the draft. I took DeAndre Jordan later in that one. That's a useless pick right there. I mean, first of all, he's an Aggie. Terrible. So we don't <laughs> like that. Um, but, I mean, I don't know, you know, is how, how long – what I hate about him the most is how much he's going to eat into another Longhorn, uh, Jared Allen. Yeah, I, he's going to eat into Jared Allen, and it kind of brings his value uh, back down to earth. So, uh, I mean, you know, you could do worse at, at a late round. And I, is he? How good did he end up with his free throw percentage last year? With the Knicks, he actually shot in the seventies. I think for the season, he was in the in the high sixties, which is kind of crazy that we've now, after all this time, it's just like, oh. Oh, and whatever was I mean, going on between his ears for the first decade of his career is is apparently gone now. Yeah, well, hey man, whatever works, right? So I guess uh, he's better than Russell Westbrook, probably. So <laughs> at, the, there's that. at the at the line, right? Not not in general. <laughs> yeah, well, at the line, right? right. Uh, he was number sixty five at nine cat last year, playing almost thirty minutes a game. I just I can't imagine that they're going to run him out there 30 minutes a night. Yeah, in... minutes. No, yeah, I mean, no this way. is a team targeting, what, like a seven, six, seven seed this year while they wait on Kevin Durant? That's not, you know, they're not getting past the Phillies, the the probably not even the Torontos at the top of the East. That, that They're a lower half playoff team without Kevin Durant. They're going to be decent, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah. uh, Kyrie in a leadership role is just not a good situation, you know. Yeah. And I don't know that Durant is in, you know, another Longhorn. Uh, I don't know that Durant in a leadership role is the best either. But uh, Kyrie's really, really folded up for Boston uh, in that role last year. So yeah, that who knows great. what to expect here. Well, you want to talk about DJ Augustine before you go? We can knock out the whole... The Texas. Oh, whatever. <laughs> you and Jonas always <laughs> crapped on DJ. I he put do. up decent numbers. And look, they still don't have another starting point guard I in know. Orlando, right? What have they done? I mean, really, they're, Orlando. They're banking on Markel Fultz. So. That's a bad bank to go to. That is not a shoulder <laughs> issue. As Are people officially over into my camp now that never bought the shoulder thing? That's not a shoulder. It, but the th- <sighs> There's no way it can be a shoulder unless he's having it removed. I mean, it, that that excuse is done with. Well, whatever it is now, it's got to be between the years. Yeah, I mean, and that's I know okay. shoulders take a long time and everything, but come on, man. Yeah. You got to get it right. It's not the shoulder. And that and the, the thing, and I've, I ranted about this on a big three at one point last year, it's okay that it's not the shoulder. I just, I feel like they're doing him such a disservice by not just addressing this head on. Like, isn't, I, I, I'm not an alcoholic, but I certainly have known a few. Uh, I'm fairly certain that one of the steps is admitting you have a problem, right? Like admitting where the, the issue exists instead of trying to blame it on something else. There, it, there's a responsibility factor here. And I feel like the people around him that are trying to put out this narrative that, oh, it's just, you know, we're going to do a surgery or we're going to like massage a shoulder socket back into place. 
it's not allowing him to to deal with the the whole situation. Eh, whatever. I just I don't. And think they're it's acting fair. like he's a baby too. It's uh oh, we're happy about his work this summer. This situation is unfortunate. No, it's not unfortunate. He's either hurt or he ain't hurt. Like there, there's no in between there. Yeah. You're the, you're either banged up or you're injured. There's a difference. And he is uh he's not injured anymore, I don't think. No. And if he is, come out and say that. So I don't know. I'm kinda sick of that situation. But it, all of it means is that our guy, DJ Augustine, <laughs> back for another year, gonna have value in all your leagues. So those of you who are waiting for a point guard. Uh, he's a better option than Michael Carter Williams, right? This so is let's true. Go. This is true. I can't argue with that. I just, oh man, I'm so. This is an era where NBA teams have uh, psychiatrists like on retainer now. We know that there's anxiety. It's it's out in the open. Let's let's talk about the the mental side here. I, I just I feel like they're making it worse by trying to hide whatever's going on. Anyway, you uh, let's get Mo Bamba going. Come on. Where where is he too? Yeah, Let's well, get him going. All Ed, the Longhorns. <laughs> or like we. Oh yeah, good point. I totally forgot about that one. Um, yeah, Orlando probably would have been better served being terrible last year because then they could have at least sort of moved on to the full youth thing. But now uh, they're they're fighting hard to to get one click faster on the treadmill. Um, Bogdan, you mentioned last pick. Uh, this is a guy that wasn't getting drafted until he turned it up in international play. He was close to being interesting last year and he just totally fell apart the second half of the year um but when he was good the first half he was kind of like a top 90 guy i get this pick this is an okay flyer yeah i mean that's just exactly what it is it's a flyer you know we'll see um with this kind of new uh sacramento team how he fits in and all that stuff and um you know we'll see uh, this this i i i kind of like taking i i like if, if you haven't noticed my strategy is I'm going to get the stuff that's hard to come by in my early picks. I'm going to get the steals. I'm going to get the blocks and the assist. I want to get those early and out of the way because you can get threes. You can get points. You can get boards uh, from uh, all kinds of role players on the back end. And like Dan mentioned, it, it in Roto, they don't have to all come – from an amazing player and you can feel free to churn these guys on the wire and just get in a good game from these guys. So we'll see. I probably won't play him early. See what the minute situation looks like here and um, how he looks because shooting, uh, you know, 41.8% ain't going to cut it. So we'll see if he gets any better. But like you said, pretty good in the international play and uh, worth a flyer at the very end. Yep. Well done. And I'm not going to ask everybody to talk about the fact that I put Boogie as the every single team's 13th. Uh, I, I saw it for a second. I was like, I don't. Why did I take Boogie? I didn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot that you put him on everybody. <laughs> everybody. You, you get a boogie. You get a boogie. Everybody gets a boogie. That's right. Full boogie action. Uh, Bogman, thank you, my good man, uh, for explaining a few picks and also illuminating a few guys that maybe folks were overlooking. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Always, always. When are we starting the big three? Can we? Do we have an, an announcement yet, or is it a everybody just stay tuned? I think it's an everybody stay tuned. I, I I will tell you that I'm getting hammered over the head. People want at least one preseason big three. Ooh. So I actually have Jonas on uh, tomorrow, I believe Wednesday. If you're listening to this, uh, Wednesday the what would that be? The 25th. That that show should be dropping. So I have him. I had you. I had Doctor A interviewing you guys uh before the season starts so we'll try to we'll try to get that scheduled up and get one preseason big three in but uh big three is an in-season show so Hell season yeah. starts the 22nd we'll start the uh following week at bogman sports b-o-g-m-a-n sports on twitter follow him immediately one of my best buddies here in this fantasy weirdo world thank you my man <laughs> you got any time dan i didn't even tell you guys what was coming up after our wonderful interview with the Bogman, Lord Bogman. Uh, we'll actually get that full story from the Welsh on tomorrow's show. That'll be, uh, wanted to pair those guys up on back-to-back days. The rest of today, number one, we've got a coupon code to give you. I'll tell you what it's for and why. Number two, I got to tell you about my bookie. And number three, I want to tell you guys what the hell we're doing the rest of today's show. And in no particular order... We've been breaking down this same one industry mock for now a week and a day. 
The problem with that, while fantastic and I'm having a ton of fun with the shows, is that over the two and change weeks that we're going to be talking about this one mock draft, things are changing. So what I thought I'd do was bring in a little bit of new information. So coming up in just about two minutes here on today's show, I'm going to break down the first 20 picks of a different mock draft. This is also an industry mock. It's a 20-teamer going on. I've been tweeting about it. Uh, it's got <laughs> 20 fantasy analysts in it, which might surprise you to know how many analysts there are that work on fantasy basketball. At least 20, based on the numbers I'm counting from this particular draft. Uh, and we'll go over the first round of that. But I do think the, the top 20 is kind of an interesting landmark. So we'll do that in just a couple of minutes. I wanted to tell you about today's coupon code. The code is BOGMAN, B-O-G-M-A-N. That will get you $3 off any item at hoop-ball.com. What are the items that you can use it on? Well, that's a reasonable follow-up question. Again, $3 off with the coupon. You can get the Brewski 150 available now and on sale starting today because one week from today, the B-150 goes into the draft guide. So here's the whole breakdown on that. The B-150 is Aaron Bruski's top 150 fantasy players for this coming season. It has all sorts of breakout candidates, sleepers. I know people love that terminology. I'm less a fan of it, but I use it because I think people understand it better. Uh, and it's just it takes a lot of swings, and it also points out some spots where there are just some really easy values as well. Uh, Aaron does it every year. With the B-150, if you're in an intermediate league, you could basically just win your league on draft night. Expert league, you're going to have to take some swings. You're going to have to get some great pickups. If you're in a, 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 a very easy league, I mean, you'll just blow everybody out of the water. You'll boat race them. It's Aaron's sort of proprietary method. He puts in hundreds and hundreds of hours throughout the whole offseason going over tape and running numbers and doing projections and all that good stuff. And so right now, it's on sale because... If you get the draft guide, you'll get it in a week anyway. But if you can't wait a week, namely if you are just so geeked up that you got to see them now, or if you have your draft this week or starting this week, you can get the B-150 early. That you can use the coupon code on. You can use it on the draft guide to knock it down from $17.99 to $14.99. You can use it on our full season premium membership, which we're calling Game Time Premium this year. And you can use it on any package of those items which we have the pro package, the champions pack that puts different parts of that together. Use the coupon. Again, go to hoop-ball.com, click on the premium tab and choose to buy the draft guide. It'll take you to the landing page where you can see all five things for sale. Again, the coupon code BOGMAN, B-O-G-M-A-N. You get three bucks off any of those items at hoop-ball.com. Also want to remind everybody, as we now count down the days until when we can actually place some in Real game wagers on the NBA, and we'll be talking to Neil Rochelani tomorrow about more of the full season futures stuff. We talked MV, uh, MVP race last week. You should be doing that with our buddies at mybookie.ag. Obviously, NFL is the big thing right now. That's what they got running, uh, but they got the NBA stuff ready to go as well. Go there now. Use the promo code TODAY. T-O-D-A-Y is the word TODAY is the promo code, and they will match your first deposit. That's right, mybookie.ag, they will deposit match you up to 1000 bucks. I'll be doing some smaller portion of that to get my stuff together. I'm taking it out of all the other sites I already have, uh, moving it over. I mean, it takes some time. I started it weeks ago because these other sites are slow and unpredictable. And I'm moving it over to my bookie. I'm getting that deposit match, and I'm going to be playing with that all season long. I wouldn't tell it you guys to work with them if they weren't the best. I, I mean, ask anybody. Brew's moved his money over there. Neil's going to do it. Uh, we're getting involved. This is a great new partner. They're making the online betting landscape a good one, a trustworthy one. And they've got all these really fun options as well. I mean, the fun stuff is good, but you want to be able to trust the place you're betting, and they are that spot. Again, mybookie.ag. Promo code is the word today. So here's what I was promising. Because we've been talking about this one draft over and over again, and you guys, I hope, are pulling big picture things from our chats with all of these industry pros, I did want to make sure that we were sort of catching up on where things were changing in the draft landscape. So let's take part of today, and I don't think I'm going to go any farther than that. If you want to see how the rest of this particular draft goes, just follow me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris. 
uh, myself and Adam King, who you will hear from uh, either later this week or early next as one of the guys we're talking to on this podcast, we're actually live tweeting every pick from this particular draft. But I wanted to discuss the top 20 because things move, little things tweak here and there. Uh, and you'll see a couple of them as I go through these names over the rest of today's show. So let's start at the top, and obviously the top five don't change. The order does, but the names don't. Anthony Davis went first, Carl Anthony Towns went second, James Harden went third, Steph Curry went fourth. Force? Use the force. Steph Curry went fourth. Giannis Antetokounmpo went fifth, which is actually close to my personal setup on this. This is a nine-category Roto League. For me, AD's going first, just because that ceiling is so absurdly high. But Steph Curry is probably my number two guy in Roto, because I'm less worried about a game he might miss at the end of the year. I think he's going to have to play, so he'll push himself through some of the little nagging stuff. And he is going to go supernova. They have no choice. I mean, look at the things that he did. And yeah, there's no Clay Thompson to help spread the floor as much. D'Angelo Russell will do a little bit of that, but not even close to what Clay can do from outside. Uh, it's going to be a, a wildly Steph-centric offense. When he gets that level of usage, and it's a big bump, even if his field goal percent takes a little bit of a hit, the volume is going to be obscene. Yes, Cat and James Harden are the two durability picks in this bunch, and you can't go wrong with either of them. But as long as you're in this top five, you might as well take a little bit of a swing. Steph is not going to kill you. He's not going to sit long term. If he turns an ankle, he's going to play as soon as he can this year. It's not going to be like seasons past where they knew they were going to coast to 63 wins and he could sit out an extra week. They need him for those three games, especially early in the season where they're trying to figure each other out and not fall sort of underwater at all. Yeah, I'm sure Clay Thompson, if he comes back in February, March, whatever it is, yeah, that'll shake things up a little bit. But again, Roto, all of the stuff that he's going to do over those first four months, that matters. You can just pile up numbers with him. I'm probably going hard in third just because of the safety of it all. But again, that one's a, a little bit of a coin flip. Uh, there are just so many incredible big men out there that a guy like Carl Anthony Towns, who's just incredible to go along with that theme, uh, there are options coming back generally, at least if you're in a 12-team or towards the end of the second round, that don't do the same things as him, but give you a reasonable fact similarly, whereas there just isn't a guy that can do what James Harden does at any point, really, the rest of the way. And then Giannis is always my five because he doesn't shoot free throws well and he doesn't shoot any three-pointers. And so even though a lot of his other stuff is great, he's got anchors and anchors are tough. The other stuff he does might even be better than some of the other dudes on this top five list. But when a guy is weighing you down, I can't push him over the other names. Nikola Jokic, we almost... And he went sixth in this one. He goes sixth in everything. I, I think it's a little bit presumptuous. And I know I'm sort of, I'm waiting until pretty deep here into draft season to partially change my tune. I had, like so many of you, just accepted the fact that Jokic was going at six in every single fantasy draft as fact and never really stopped to question it. But look at last year. He went for 20, 11, and 7 with 1.4 steals, 0.7 blocks, so 2.1 defensive stats, 51% for the field, 82 at the foul line, a three-pointer and three turnovers per game. Tell me, please, where his numbers are set to bump up in any significant way. His season was awesome. Just awesome. But I don't see him blocking more shots. I don't see him rebounding more than 11. I don't see him having more than 7.5 assists a game. I mean, that's crazy numbers already. The only thing you could see would be, does he take an extra shot? And on a very deep Denver team, that's a tough sell to me. Can he increase his volume? I wish he would, and he did 
or does at times during the postseason. But the long regular season, I think he much prefers to just hang out, make sweet passes. It's less work. Keeps him on the floor. He's been he's shown himself to be relatively durable last year. But again, you know, you bank on durability. You just never know what can happen with kind of a soft-bodied big man. I love Nikola Jokic. Is he as clear a number six as we're anointing him? Thanks to playing 80 games last year, he was actually number seven overall. Which is a really kooky thing to look at because he and Damian Lillard were basically the exact same in value and they played the same number of games and yet in totals, Jokic flips and moves just ever so slightly ahead of him, likely because of uh, what stats they were best at. But there are guys in this mix... Steph Curry, for instance, who were behind them last year, that will likely move in front. So you got to run the math a little bit on this. Is it as obvious as it seems? Anthony Davis and Steph Curry will probably finish in front of Jokic this year. In totals, they were behind him last season. Paul George, Kevin Durant, they will likely finish behind him. So that's a wash. So what what we're saying now is, will... Vucevic, who finished fifth in totals last year, will he finish in front of Jokic? Eh, questionable. But again, he did it last year. It was close. Very tight squeeze, but it was close. Could Bradley Beal do it? He was number 10 last year in 82 games. Questionable, but, you know, he legitimately could average close to 30 points per game. I mean, he was at 26 last year, and they have even less around him Kemba no Kyrie only if he plays like 78 games so that's not happening Joel Embiid and Kawhi Leonard those are the other guys that could get up into the mix but they also would have to get into the 70s and games played so what we're asking ourselves here is will Vooch finish in front of Jokic again most people are banking on no could Beal or Lillard get in front of Jokic most people are saying no And then will any of those ultra-high per-game guys who generally are missing games, Embiid, Irving, and Kawhi, will any of them play enough games to make it competitive? And the answer is, really, it would have to be Embiid or Kawhi, and I don't see either one of those guys playing more than 72 games. So the the last question becomes, is Jokic really going to play 80 games again this year? Because I think they'll give him a a couple of nights off here and there. I feel like they're gunning more for the playoffs now. At the end of all of this discussion, I don't... I guess the point is, I don't know that it's as completely set in stone that Jokic should be the number six guy. But if I have the six pick, I am probably still taking him. Joel Embiid went at seven in this format, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I think because it's a 20-teamer, you're seeing guys take a little bit more of a swing and hope that guys can play the extra few games. LeBron went at 8, so that's the other direction. A guy with a lower per-game note expected to play a lot of games and have a very efficient year. And then Damian Lillard fell all the way to 9. Super surprising, uh, but I'm sure that that was Adam, actually. Adam King was probably pretty pleased to get someone as safe as Lillard. Because at 7 with Dame, you're saying, yeah, I'm comfortable taking a guy who's probably going to be around 12th in per game. He's always right on the edge of the first round. Uh, but is generally fairly durable. He played 80 games last year. So I'm okay with that. You know, at nine, you're like, all right, well, you know, he plays his games, so he'll push himself up a little bit. He doesn't hurt me very much. At seven, you are taking a little bit of a dip in per game. You know, because last year, uh, Dame was the number 12 per game guy. Vooch, Kyrie, Embiid, Durant, Kawhi were all in front of him in that sort of second echelon. And then Paul George, remember, was up at number three. And then Jokic was basically right there with Lillard as well. So there were a few other things going on there. But at 9, absolutely. I went Bradley Beal. This was my spot. I took Beal at 10th, which I thought was a very reasonable spot. He could actually be around the 10th ranked guy on a per-game basis. And in Roto, I'm not worried about him missing the last two or three games of the year. Andre Drummond went at 11, which again is... This is actually a guy I like a lot. And this is partly, uh, I think 
something to do with the 20 team league. This was uh, our buddy Alex. You know, none of these guys are going to come close to getting back to you because right here in the middle of this 20 teamer, you're looking at pick 10 ish and then pick 30 ish. So, whatever guy you take, you really have to think team build. So, for Alex here, it was do I take one of the remaining super high per game dudes who's almost definitely going to miss 12 to 15 games, which is Kawhi, Kyrie, Paul George? Do I take Vooch and hope that he can recreate last year? Do I take Drew Holiday? and hope that he can elevate himself and play all 82 games? Or do I take Andre Drummond, who, we've talked about it, finished last year inside the top five the last two months of the year? So he went the defensive direction. And you can kind of build your team around it. I make all these rules about punting in Roto. Uh, It's going to be really hard to build a team with outstanding free throw numbers to offset Drummond in a 20-teamer. But you can certainly build around his strengths in this format. Kawhi Leonard went at 12. Um, I, I, again, I've been sweetening on Kawhi. In every show, I think you guys hear me talk about how I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to considering him in this spot. If I'm on the turn, I probably am taking one very safe guy and then someone like Kawhi or Embiid, if either one of them is there. Certainly not both. That's too much risk. But, you know, if Kawhi plays 72 games, he won't. But if he does, he's an easy first-rounder. Russell Westbrook went at 13 in this format, which uh, probably a little bit of a reach on him, given his issues and how you can't trust his free throw percent. Kyrie Irving at 14. I don't know if this has something to do with him breaking his face, but this is a really nice spot to get him because at 14, you no longer need him to play every single game. He was the number 10th ranked player on a per game note last year, and he was number 15 in just 67 games. So you're two games away from value on him. If he gets to 69 games this year, then he beats this mark. Drew Holiday at 15, very reasonable spot. I think he's been going too early in a lot of drafts. Uh, He should be kind of a mid-second rounder. And this is close to where he is. Very safe play here. Paul George went at 16. At that point, you you have to strongly consider it. But man, if he misses a month, two months, this team is cooked. In a 20-teamer, you just have to have the games from your guys at the top. Certainly to start the year, or else you get end up behind the eight ball. So I know at 16, he's a value because he could end up as a number three performer, number you know top five once he's on the floor. But we just don't know when he's going to play. I'm still waiting for a good news break. Rudy Gobert at 17. There are a couple of guys I probably would have gone in front of at this point. But now you kind of have a build a little bit. Vooch at 18. He's one of the guys I would have gone with first just because he's better across the board. And Roto, you just can't afford to sacrifice something. Kemba Walker at 19. Very safe. Trey Young at 20. And again, you know, you have decisions to make in a 20 team league. I don't think I'm taking, I don't think I'm taking Trey at 20 in a 12 teamer. Well, now let me rethink that said that statement. I I don't think I'm taking him at 20 in most spots. And and that's just, here's the thing. We all have opinions on stuff. You guys know that I'm a little bit more hesitant to take a, a guy that was showing the ability to get close to this spot, but 20 is a big jump. And, if, you know, if he's in the top 40 and he plays all 82 games, he could actually get pretty damn close to this spot. Uh, but in 9-cat, th- this is a big thump to take in turnovers. Whereas, you know, you take that type of thump with James Harden, he carries you in a number of categories. Trey Young could sort of carry you in assists, but there's a lot of stuff that, that drags him down a little bit. So, for me, a little bit too early. But at the same time, in a 20-teamer, you have to choose how you're going to build your team. And this is a spot on the turn now, so picks 20 and then 21 coming right after it. You can go with a pairing. You don't have to worry about the next guy. You've got your two guys. You grab them back-to-back, and you can assess your team, and you have basically 40 picks to think about it. You don't have to to do anything. Slow draft when you're on a turn. Goodness gracious, it's forever. So in terms of what I thought was interesting the pulls, the takeaways from this new first round we went over. Uh, Number one, 
Westbrook moving a tiny bit earlier again, perhaps again the byproduct of a 20-team league. I thought it was interesting that Kyrie Irving went later than I expected. He's been going inside the top 10, at least the top 12 in a lot of spots, and he went at 14 behind Drummond, behind Kawhi, behind Russ. That surprised me. Does that mean he's moving down the board? Something to keep an eye on. I thought it was interesting that Jimmy Butler didn't actually go until uh, three picks after we finished talking, 23. He's a guy that should be going, I think, inside the top 16. And I think in this 20-team format, more than anything, you're not looking at guys that are moving because their value assessment is changing. You're looking at guys moving because of how teams are strategizing. You're seeing a lot of clubs taking different tacks on this bigger format where some of the teams are saying, you know what, I just need I need 80 games out of a top 15 guy. Because in a 20-team league, if I have one of those guys, if I have a top 15 guy on my team, well, that puts me in front of at least five teams. Because most likely five teams won't. Possibly more, if somebody has more than one top 15 guy on their team. Whereas some of the teams are saying, screw this, you know, I have the 11th, 12th, or I have the ninth, 10th pick, whatever it is, uh, I'm going to take a guy that might not play 70 games, but if he does, I push my way. I, I suddenly, I've got like a top five or six guy, and I can leapfrog some teams. I don't see the... To me, the, the risks outweigh the reward, at least in the first round, and at least if you're in the, you know, the front like 12 or 13 of the first round, where you have an opportunity to go get somebody relatively safe. Once you get towards the back end of that, picks 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, whatever, then you're looking at a spot where, yeah, the guy 10 picks in front of you has an enormous advantage with a Harden or Steph, where you're picking from Gobert, Paul George, and Drew Holiday. So in that spot, I get it. You take Paul George, you're like, I mean, you know, bleep this, I need a guy that can give me production like one of those top three dudes, or I'm going to get swamped by those teams. But those in-between, the in-between guys, seven through, call it 13, to me, and feel free to tell me I'm wrong, because I'm sure there's, there is merit to the other side as well. Lord knows there's merit to the other side. I want my 78 to 80 games of a top 12 to 15 guy even if I have the ninth or 10th pick, because if I pick a guy in there that puts up top 20 on the year, I'm screwed because I don't have another pick for 20 spots. If I pick a guy in there that's going top 14 and plays 80 games and that turns him into a top 10 guy, that's all I need. Don't screw it up early. And it's a bigger deal the bigger league you're in. Don't screw it up early because you don't have another pick. You have to nail something later, like a really big deal nail later, if you biff one early. You know how, how safe I like to play it in the first three rounds of a standard league. You go a little bit smaller than that in a big league because in the middle rounds you have to sort of go get your guy because you're not going to have a pick for 20 to 40 spots. Uh, at the first round, you just you can't. You cannot torch your team right out of the chute. Can't do it. The rest of the week on Fantasy NBA Today. If there's time, we'll look at a few more picks from this draft or possibly even a different one. Uh, but we're going to have uh, our usual assortment of hoop ball partners on here. We'll talk to Neil Rochlani tomorrow. We'll get into some betting stuff along with uh, the Welsh. will be our guest pro on tomorrow's show. Wednesday, we'll talk to Brandon Marcus. We'll have uh, our third pro of the week. Thursday, quick hit from Coach as they do their last of the weekly DFS Today shows before going daily, I believe, starting next week. And uh, then Friday, we'll get our sort of eyes on the ground. Sweet Nuggets with Adrian Benjamins. Again, f- there will be a pro every single day this week and the first two next week. And then we'll segue into chatting with some other industry professionals that were not in this mock draft. That makes them just as smart if not smarter because that means they didn't say yes to me <laughs> uh or we just ran out of space too soon so that's uh, that's going to be great as well uh thanks once again to bogman again the code today is bogman if you want to get three bucks off anything over at hoopball he is at bogman sports i am at dan Bespris on twitter 
please take a moment to rate and review the podcast. Drop it a five-star bad boy on iTunes. We really, 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 really appreciate that. Have a wonderful Monday. That's it. I'm taking a pin, metaphorically, popping it in this bad boy. We'll talk to you tomorrow, everybody. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.